Okay, let's uh, begin. Today we're going to talk about uh, forecasting asset returns. So I said in previous um, lectures, in terms of asset allocation, that's uh, either strategic or tactical. The most important input that you can get are, are the forecast of returns. On Monday, we're going to be talking about uh, volatility and uh, correlation and skewness and inputs like that. But by far, the most important is to get the return forecast correct. And that's exactly what you're working on in assignment number uh, three. If you've looked at that. I made some minor changes to assignment number three. Um, if you want to pull down a fresh copy, you can. It doesn't involve any more work. Just a wording here and there. Um, and I've also sent an email with the, uh, some data definitions from the IFC files if you're using uh, emerging markets uh, in your asset allocation. Okay. Uh, the other thing, um, I, I do put together like a, a PDF often of the actual slides that I'll show uh, today. It's not on the CD-ROM, but it is on the iDrive. So um, that's available. Um, you could you could print that out. It's like 16 pages. And uh, webcast students, I actually emailed that PDF to you um, this morning, as I did in uh, previous lectures. So so that's available um, for you. Um, okay. So uh, I will. If you really think about this, there's at least four things that we need. We need the expected returns. We need the volatility. We need the correlation. We need some idea of risk tolerance also. And there's these higher moments also, like skewness, that we should be aware of. But uh, indeed, what we're doing is allocating roughly one lecture to volatility, correlation, and skew, and um, one lecture devoted to expected returns, which is uh, today. <coughs> what I want to do is to basically go through um, the framework whereby I think that you could sit down and come up with some economic justifications for what you're doing in assignment number three. As I said last lecture, I don't want assignment number three to turn into a data dredging exercise. And you don't need to feel that you've got to find a model that predicts a particular equity return. If you don't find it, that's fine. If there's no predictability, then we'll just use the average return, the unconditional return. And that's fine. It's far better to do that than to dredge the data, find some predictability that's not real, and then start allocating real funds based upon um, you know, some spurious predictability. That's going to set you up to be a loser. Okay, so. Um, and it's sometimes hard to get that across because you really want to find that predictability sometimes because that predictability has a big impact on your performance. So there's, and, and I've seen this before. You know, I've seen um, practitioner um, uh, publications and uh, sometimes internal publications where it's real clear that they have dredged the data to try to find the best model. Indeed, I was uh, having lunch one day, um, and I guess I can't name the, uh, the investment bank, but let's say it's a very distinguished investment bank. Uh, and they were kind of showing me the most recent uh, kind of internal research uh, that had to do with tactical asset allocation. And they were predicting country returns, just like I've done in some of my research, and you've seen that. And uh, indeed, a uh, couple of the countries appeared to, to have um, you know, better predictability than I documented in, in my research, which maybe is no surprise given that you've got a crew of people working on this full time. And 
They've got a lot more time to, and on top of that, they've got real dollars, uh, you know, contingent upon the strategy. So I take a look at the model, and it's got some stuff in it that I thought was questionable. For example, one of the variables that came in with the best T statistic was, and this is a monthly forecasting model, was the seventh lag of the oil price change. Okay. Let's think about that. The seventh lag. So I said, well, why the seventh lag? What about the first or second? third, or maybe some sort of distributed lag of, of, of all of them. And you know, a story was, was told that it takes a while for the price to be incorporated in the production process and make it way to the consumer and you know, blah, blah, blah. And I wasn't convinced. It, it, it seems very strange to me that, and basically you know what the story is, that if you do the sixth lag, doesn't come in, or it would have been there, or the fifth, or the fourth. And if we really think about what we've learned in statistics, um, we could probably drop a lot of these lags in, and just by pure chance, one of them is going to come in with a T ratio of two. And it turned out the seventh came in. Now that, to me, is not a model that is going to be a sustainable model in the future. And indeed, uh, it wasn't. It was, uh, I think, um, either the model was changed or the person that built the model was changed. Okay, so beware of, of stuff like that. Okay, so so let's. What a, the plan for today is is to go through kind of a, a fundamental valuation model that you've seen before, and to talk about the different possibilities for uh, predictability. And, and then um, kind of brainstorm some variables. And this is going to frame your kind of group discussion for assignment number three, for those that choose to do assignment number three. Okay, so that's kind of um, where we're going. There's two things that we need to, to think about before we even start this exercise. And um, you know, some of these, uh, some of these points are our econometric points, and I'm going to leave those, and we're going to be talking about different econometric models uh, as, as we actually uh, go through and, and construct this, this exercise. <coughs> One thing is that our model should be parsimonious. So it shouldn't have too many variables in it. And indeed, for the models that you're doing, I would say that um, the maximum number of variables that I would want to see, like separate variables, would be like five. And probably better to go even lower dimensionality. And if you've got a shorter sample, <coughs> then you've got to cut it down. The more variables, the more unreliable this model is going to be out of sample. So that's the first thing. Um, more on the econometric points. Don't be too concerned if you've got some autocorrelation as long as it isn't chronic. If you all of a sudden, if you're forecasting a return and you've got um, a, a Durbin Watson of uh, less than one, then you have a real problem with your regression model. Like something's wrong, like you're not using a return, you're using a price. Don't worry too much about heteroskedasticity. It doesn't affect the forecast. It will affect your inference on your standard errors, your T-ratios, but it's not going to be um, the death blow uh, to your model. With some exceptions, like what we did last time, <coughs> that longer horizon forecast. That's all important. Number four, stability. Something you might want to check. Split your sample in two. It's the simplest uh, classic test. Take a look run the regression you know, before the split, after the split. And if there's big changes in the coefficients, then beware. Okay, because you're fitting your model using all of the data. 
and then all of a sudden you want to use your model going out a sample. And if there's instability in the coefficients, it's going to lead to poor predictions. <coughs> now the other thing you need to be aware of is if you split your sample, not necessarily in the half, but in just the last couple of years, you will surely get different coefficients. Okay? You need enough data. If you don't have enough data, then those coefficients are going to just fit the most recent observations and not be reliable for out of sample forecasts. Okay, the t yes, Prakash. If uh, uh, your t statistics are good, but your means are different, but there's a lot of overlapping uh, region for correlation uh, coefficients, do you consider that to be a reasonable test? Or you're looking for something where the 95% uh, confidence interval is not overlapping at all? Um, yeah, it's kind of a complicated question because it touches on a number of things. Uh, for example, how collinear can your independent variables actually be? And I, I don't worry about that too much. Okay, that's, not, uh, that's not a chronic uh, issue unless two variables are constructed virtually identically. And you should be able to see the problem in your regression output. Um, the T statistics, the what you learned in your regression course probably was it's reliable if it's above two. The way I look at it, uh, I look at it maybe more from a Bayesian point of view. And I take seriously any variable um, that has a T ratio more than 1.2. Okay. T statistics only says that it's, you are to that degree uh, uh, confident that it's different from zero. Yes. It doesn't say anything about where in that range it would look. <coughs> no, well the T statistic, if you recollect, is the, the ratio of the coefficient to the standard error. That's all it is. So you get um, a coefficient, and let's say you estimate 0.6, and you have a standard error on that, which is, let's say, 0.1, <coughs> okay? And then you can construct a 95% confidence interval by looking at two standard errors above and below. So two standard errors, 0.2. So our confidence range would be 0.4 to 0.8. T ratio is simply the ratio of the coefficient, which is 0.6, to the standard error, which is 0.1. In this case, the T ratio is 6. Now that would be uh, like a monstrously important variable if it came in with a T ratio of 6. But what I'm saying, you're going to have trouble uh, predicting these returns. So we're going to be considering models, as I said last time, that have R squareds in a range of like 1% to maybe 10% if, you're, if you get a fairly good predictability. Okay, so I'm saying you should cut your, um, you wouldn't necessarily have a, a T ratio cutoff of 2. And remember, you know, this is all developed in the theory of classical statistics. And this is just like a number, the R squared. Remember I said uh, when we looked at that term structure graph that if you just regress on the term structure, it doesn't do that well. Yet it's got a huge amount of information about future returns, as was obvious from that graph. So be careful um, about things like R squared and, and T ratios. You know, in this business, um, I sometimes, uh, and, and, I, and I force you to do some of these things in the assignment where you look at not just the R squared and the T ratios, but how well the return forecast predicts the sign of the movement. So are you predicting up when the market's going up? Are you predicting down when the market's actually going down? So you look at the correct direction count. So some metrics like that kind of go beyond the pure statistical metrics. And indeed, um, the most uh, powerful metric for me is how the strategy actually does in terms of performance. So if you implement the strategy based upon your forecasting model, how much money does it make? So I sometimes say, well, we won't, one is not the R squared, but the money squared. And the way to do that is to implement it in uh, a trading simulation to see how well it actually helps you allocate your assets. Okay. Okay. So. It's two things that are kind of fundamental that we need to talk about first before we do this exercise. 
Um, the first thing has to do with market efficiency. And the second thing has to do with time horizon. And we've talked a bit about these things already. So let's, let's talk about efficiency first. I take the position that some <coughs> degree of predictability in the market does not <coughs> necessarily imply that the market participants are irrational. And if you actually look at some of my research papers, I make the case, and we'll be making this case in more detail when we start talking about asset pricing and predictability, I make the case that within the framework of an asset pricing model, you've got expected returns, which is what we're trying to grab, right? That are functions of risk exposures and risk premium. If there is some predictability in the risk exposures or the risk premia or the correlation between the two, that could induce predictability in the asset return. And if you really think about this, the risk loadings are unlikely to change very quickly through time. They should be slowly evolving. And it's also the case for the risk premium. They will change through time. They're very much functions of the business cycle. Okay. And we know the business cycle is somewhat predictable. So the risk premium themselves could have some level of predictability. The correlation between the loadings and the risk premium is hard to measure, but there could also be predictability there. So according to the theory of asset pricing, there could be some level of predictability that is consistent with market efficiency, with, with rational participation in the market. It's not my idea. This idea goes back to an important paper um, by Robert Lucas in 1978. He's a Nobel laureate, also one of my teachers. So you can set this up in a way that you don't need to assume that animal spirits are driving uh, the way that the market performs, that it can be rational participants, but it's just that there's this evolution through time of risk and reward. Okay, so I'll, I'll make that statement. Okay, but my words, actually let me repeat my words at the very beginning said that predictability in asset returns is not necessarily evidence of irrationality or market inefficiency. The key words are not necessarily. It is also possible that there's predictability in the market that is evidence of inefficiency. Indeed, if we see a high degree of predictability, then you really have to wonder why it isn't being captured. So let's put it this way. We could uncover predictability, let's say, uh, R squared 12%. A fraction of that R squared, maybe an R squared of 4%, is what you would expect given the natural evolution of risk and risk premium. But the other part, the other part is either one of, of two things. It could be purely spurious because you dredged the data to get it. And it's not going to hold up going forward. Or it could be evidence that this particular market is not very good at processing information. Okay. Now, it turns out that it's real hard to kind of divide this up. We'll find some predictability. Let's say we do find 12% in a particular market. How do, we, how do we divide it up? How do we say how much is due to asset pricing, how much is due to potentially market inefficiency? And let's just assume that we haven't uh, dredged the data. It's incredibly difficult because the part 
that is a function of asset pricing depends upon your assumptions on what the correct model is and the specification of the components of that model. So there's a debate that I participated in trying to divide this stuff up. But in the bottom line, you really can't. For us, doing real asset allocation, I'm going to argue that we don't care. You know, it's an interesting debate how much predictability is rational, how much is due to potential inefficiencies in the market, but we really don't care. What we care about is getting the best forecast. And that's what we're doing in assignment number three. Let's get the best model built, let's use that model in terms of our um, asset allocation decisions. Okay, that's number one point. Lisa. But isn't it important to know which part could be eliminated if the market did become efficient? Um, indeed. Uh, the, the question is, I think your question is, what happens when the market becomes more efficient? Okay, so, so basically what will happen is the predictability that's due to inefficiency is going to go away. Now, you still could be left with some predictability, but people that are smart in the market should be capitalizing upon that. Okay. So we have a, forecast, a, a model that's based on a forecast where there was also the um, inefficient part. That's correct. And then if that disappears, then, our then it's going to reduce your predictability, right? So your R score is going to drop, but might not be eliminated. And still, even if you've got that part of the asset return that is predictable but consistent with kind of like overall movements in the economy and risk and, and reward, you still are going to do very well if you're benchmarked uh, against uh, these naive uh, benchmarks, like we talked about last time. You know, like if you're benchmarked to a simple index like the S&P 500, that, that strategy is, is a buy and hold strategy, right? It's dynamic in that sense, but it's kind of, um, it's a mechanical uh, dynamic strategy. <coughs> so if we can extract some predictability there to be kind of switching from cash to S&P 500, and maybe allow for a little leverage, um, we're going to do fine. Actually, I'm going to show you some results uh, later on. I did this exercise with um, uh, Magnus uh, Dahlquist, um, where it, it's exactly what we did. We just looked at the T-bill, the S&P 500, looked at only one variable for prediction, and that was the term structure. Created a dynamic strategy based upon the term structure, and then dump that into the, um, the efficient frontier to see what would happen. So you've got two points. You've got the T-bill, which doesn't have zero volatility, right? You've got the S&P 500. Both of those are kind of buy and hold. Then you've got the frontier that we talked about last time. And that's basically fixed weight strategy. And so well, what happens if you allow for dynamic strategies where your decision as to how much to weight the T-bill or the S&P 500 is contingent upon the slope of the term structure. What happens to that frontier? And I'll show you that later on. It's really powerful. Okay, so, and, and I kind of assume that the S&P 500 is pretty well studied. You know, maybe you have a few people out there with these models with the seventh lag of the oil price, but most of them are not major players. Okay, so it's pretty well studied. There's a lot of dough on the line for the S&P 500 to get that right. And it's very easy to do this uh, dynamic allocation between S&P 500 and cash. That's the futures market. Incredibly easy. Okay, so the predictability that's due to inefficiency, indeed, as more of you go out there, build these models, and start trading, that part that's due to inefficiency is going to go. But is, is uh, the part that's due to inefficiency the same? Can we assume that it's the same for all asset classes? Because if it's different for every asset class, when we are allocating to different asset classes, it's important to know which part could disappear in each. Yeah, and that's true. Uh, it's definitely not the same for different <coughs> asset classes. So, you know, I've got to believe that the, uh, the amount of predictability that's due to inefficiency in the U.S. market is 
trivial compared to the amount of inefficiency um, in a market like Colombia, okay, which traditionally has had high level of predictability. There's something going on there. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah, indeed, the first time I looked at Columbia, you could look at this in um, a paper of mine um, called Predictable Risk and Returns in Emerging Markets. So I figured, well, one of the first things I would do, I wasn't sure what would happen with emerging markets, actually, because I had forecast the returns in developed markets, and they seem difficult to forecast with some predictability. And with emerging markets, I figured, well, they're so volatile that it'd be unlikely they can get any predictability out of them. But what I found was there was more predictability in emerging markets than the developed markets. And probably the reason being that they were less informationally efficient. Columbia was one that just absolutely stunned me uh, because one of the variables uh, I, I use is a lag return. And when you do that variable with the S&P 500, it's useless. So last month's return tells you nothing about this month's return. There's, a, there's no autocorrelation in the S&P 500 on a monthly basis. That's significant. And you think about it, that's real cheap information, the autocorrelation. You know, and, and a lot of that uh, you know, people look at in terms of technical analysis and, and stuff like that. Well, when I look at the autocorrelation for Columbia in US dollar terms, first looked at it, instead of getting an uh, autocorrelation coefficient of zero, which is effectively what you get for the US, you get a coefficient of 0.49. Huge amount of predictability. Um, and do you know this uh, trick that if you, um, if you regress a return on a lag return, okay, the R squared is approximately um, just the, the square of the autocorrelation coefficient. So if I get 0.49 autocorrelation for Colombian stock returns, that means roughly uh, an R squared of 0.25. The square of the autocorrelation coefficient. 0.25 is enormous amount of energy. You know, it's just like, it's too much. And I was always asking people uh, in that market, you know, what's going on? A few people I asked at the beginning said, yeah, we know about that. Shh. Because they were trading uh, based on that. And then I noticed that this started to go away. And it's exactly you know, what you're saying, that people figured that out. And there, I think a lot of that was uh, due to like, market imperfections also, that the prices were being stale and they could cause autocorrelation also. And, um, and, and I think a lot of that went away. But nevertheless, emerging markets have more predictability in general than uh, developed markets probably exactly for the reason that you mentioned. Okay, there's another, that was the first point. Second point is, is, is quite fundamental. It's something that this course, well, there's some reading material on it. It's gonna be very uh, difficult to address. We need to have an understanding about the basic structure of what we're doing. And last time we talked about long horizon forecasting, five year forecasting. Today we're talking about one month forecasting. <coughs> what is the interplay between the two? So should I be setting up my portfolio for one month ahead? Should I be setting my portfolio for five years ahead? This is really a, a, a fundamental issue, the issue of horizon. <coughs> and if I set my portfolio for five years ahead, then do I just keep that for five years or do I constantly update it? And do I update it using the monthly data or do I have another five year forecast going? So I slip to the next month, then I make another five year forecast, and then adjust my <coughs> portfolio? Or do I go and forecast um, four years and 11 months? 
Or do I forecast one year ahead and make some deviations in, in that? This is a really big deal. Okay, and it's complicated for a number of reasons. It affects, it permeates like just about everything that we do in asset allocation. And there's a couple of, of examples that, um, uh, actually one example we talked uh, about uh, just before the lecture. Um, transactions costs are almost always ignored in asset allocation or they are um, they're put in the asset allocation algorithm in a very naive way, like constant proportional transactions costs. Really think about the transactions cost issue. It could, it could be a huge deal in terms of a short term forecast. So short term says, oh, we've got to be out of the US completely next month. Okay. And, to, and to basically sell all your stocks in the US, you're going to take a hit in terms of transactions costs. It would be a bigger hit if you had to sell all your stocks in France. Way bigger hit because it's not so easy um, in, in terms of the transactions. So the short term is telling you to do something that basically the amount of gain that you would get might be wiped out by the transactions costs. The longer horizon forecast, that's not so bad because if you're holding for five years, then you're amortizing the transactions costs over a long period of time if you hold that portfolio. So the impact of these costs really depend upon the horizon. Okay? And, and the example uh, before the lecture had to do with, uh, with taxes. So you could basically, it's always good to, to, to defer the tax over a long horizon, whereas you could be realizing um, shorter term capital gains in a short uh, horizon strategy. Do you see that? Now, to make it even more complicated, we're just looking, and, and tax is especially relevant here, another factor that's real important is what your, <coughs> your labor income looks like. Right? That's going to affect things big time. Where's that? It's nowhere in the Markowitz optimization. What about stuff like uh, just the stage of your investment cycle or, or like how old you are? So that's, you know, you can tweak the risk aversion number to get some of this. So I can make you um, not very risk averse, very tolerant of risk and, and get you to have the allocation that you should have. Your allocation right now should be, basically should be borrowing like crazy, which most of you are. Uh, <laughs> but not just to put uh, the money to Duke University's tuition. You're borrowing way more than that and just dumping it into the stock market for a long horizon. Right? And there's, you know, theory out there of dynamic asset allocation that has you changing that allocation through time. And a lot of it is dependent upon your your opportunities for, for income. <coughs> okay, so the path of income is going to be very important in kind of like determining how your weights change through time. So asset allocation is a very complicated business. What we're going to do is basically what's called static optimization. It's like one period ahead or five period ahead. It doesn't take into account the stuff in between. Want to learn more about that? There's a PDF on um, the, the CD-ROM. Um, uh, Luis Viseria, John Campbell, and they made some progress in this dynamic, what's known as dynamic asset allocation. Indeed, the way to do this, did you uh, do um, in your whatever, uh, not stack course, but operations course, the theory of um, dynamic programming? No? Well, it's, uh, you, did, you did linear programming, right? Or something like that. And that's really kind of a static uh, optimization. It's really not much different than what we do uh, for the Markowitz optimization, except Markowitz optimization is a quadratic program. 
is quadratic because the variance has got a square on it. Okay, so you could do basically the whole thing within, what uh, software did you use for that? Or did you, for linear programming? Hmm? Yeah, it doesn't matter. You know, you, you can do the whole thing within that uh, software also, you don't need to use Excel. Okay, it's a quadratic program, it's basically a static program, it looks one period ahead, it doesn't affect, uh, it's not affected by all these other variables going on. The idea of a dynamic program and the way to solve a dynamic program is to look at the endpoint and work backwards. You think about it as, um, what is it, uh, Deep Blue and versus uh, the Grand Master. How would you, how would you code that up? And, and it's, it's a dynamic program. And it is unbelievably complex. To work back from all of these possibilities. And we don't have the computing power to do it. Okay, so the models of dynamic asset allocation are very simple models right now. They look at only a few scenarios. And even those models are just incredibly computationally intensive. Okay, so, um, so we're going to do static asset allocation, but you need to know it. Very important for you to know that this is not optimal. Optimal asset allocation must include the dynamic portion. Okay, so we'll, we'll make statements like, well, this is the optimal portfolio. It's optimal only in the context of static, one period ahead optimization, and it's optimal in the context that we only care about, care about the mean and the variance. Okay, that's what we mean by that. It is surely not optimal if we consider the whole situation in terms of your labor income and how you're going to invest your time. Consider uh, the claims that are made by you know, a lot of these um, mutual funds will do the asset allocation for you online and say, well, this is your optimal portfolio. You give it, you know, it, it figures out what your risk aversion is roughly by, you know, some examples. And you've got some average returns and, 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 and suppose those average returns are accurate of the future. So they're expected returns. So let, let's give them that. So let's say that their forecast of returns is, is accurate, their volatilities, their correlations are accurate, they got the risk aversion right, we don't care about skewness and kurtosis, we're mean variance uh, people. Give them all of that. And then they say, this is your asset allocation, it's optimal, wrong. It's not optimal. Actually, there's one situation where it's optimal, and that is if the person has got um, what's known as log utility risk aversion coefficient of one, then the static and the dynamic are the same. The probability that somebody's got log utility, I think is pretty remote. I don't have log utility. So, so the claims that are being made that this is optimal for this particular uh, consumer, you know, those claims, I, I think it's, it's um, I gotta be real careful what I say, I guess. Um, those claims are um, potentially misleading. Okay, because they're only looking at, at static, sort of static problems. Once you introduce the dynamics, it's different. So you need to realize that. If you're gonna do asset allocation, you need to know that it's more complicated then forecasting returns and volatilities and correlations and skewness and dumping it in to some sort of optimizer. That is good if you're myopic. You're not looking well into the future. Okay? This dynamic asset allocation does solve the problem of the different horizons. That's solved. Okay, so that's, those two things are very important for you to realize before we go any further. Now, 
the dynamic, and there's some people <coughs> making some, some very good progress on this in terms of uh, academic research. It's still real early, and it's still clear that we don't have the horsepower to do this. <coughs> Indeed, there was one paper uh, published in the Journal of Economic Dynamics and Control. And um, one of the co-authors um, had access to like 50 spark stations at Hughes Aircraft. And they just let this program run for a year. And they got some results. And you look at their model, it's a real simple model. But it needed just an incredible amount of horsepower just to get those results. This is something you need to be aware of because this is something of the future. I showed you the very second uh, lecture. We talked about how fast the computing power is growing. Well, it's going to be five or ten years before we can actually do this right. And you need to know that that's going to be on the horizon. Okay, so that's kind of my, my two caveats. Let's go and talk about uh, predictability and kind of brainstorm uh, some variables that would be useful for that. Okay, so I'm going to go to the overhead and put up a familiar uh, equation. This is, you know this is kind of like the, the first model that you get from um, you know, finance uh, 350. Valuation is going to be determined by expected cash flows. And then in the simple uh, Gordon growth model where growth is constant, where the discount rate is constant, uh, where you can actually, um, you know, exactly model those expected cash flows, you've got um, the denominator being expected return minus expected growth. I think that this is kind of a useful spot to start thinking about the variables that might predict asset returns. And basically what I would like to do is to take that as a starting point and then go through those terms and figure out what variables might predict each of those terms. And then we can develop a list. And that's really what I'm uh, headed towards. So I'm going to put down a sheet of paper and, and let's actually uh, go through and try to develop a, a list of uh, possible predictor variables. Okay, so a lot of this is uh, up to you as to what you think is reasonable. It's kind of like you're sitting in your group trying to figure out the optimal variables for uh, predicting a particular market. We'll make it generic. Okay, there might be th things that are specific to an asset class or a country. Let's just talk uh, about kind of, kind of a general market um, without putting a name on it. And what variables might be useful in prediction. So these are all variables that are known. So if I'm predicting in assignment number three, you've got data going through December 2000. We're going to be fitting a model and we're going to be doing an out of sample forecast for January uh, 2001. Okay, now we actually know what happened obviously in January 2001, so it's not really out of sample, but effectively it is because your data doesn't go beyond that particular point. Okay? In, in terms of uh, uh, real world asset allocation. Yesterday people were up late. Okay, because end of the month data comes in, you have to update your models, potentially re-estimate your regressions, make forecasts, and um, basically put together a new set of weights, put some sort of memo out explaining why the weights are, are changing. Okay, so, so the end of the month day is, uh, is a pretty busy day. But I've got to admit that uh, if you're doing this right, um, it could be reasonably automated. So the other days in the month might not be that bad, but the end of the month is a tough day. 
Okay, so, so what predicts, what do you think is a reasonable thing that might predict a return? And, and, and let me give you some ideas here uh, to kind of frame this. What we'd like are variables that potentially include information about the future. They say something about the future. So it's available today, but it yields some information about what might happen in the future. Yes? You mentioned oil prices earlier. I don't know what it is. Okay, so um, oil prices. So let's uh, let's list that one. <clears throat> and what does that impact in terms of um, what does it impact in terms of our fundamental valuation model? So, uh, so uh, we know, and, uh, and I think everybody knows here, that there's a relation between the business cycle and oil prices. So oil price spikes uh, are associated with like four of the last five downturns, basically, um, in the US. So it says something about economic growth. It says something about the numerator, the cash flows. Does it say anything else? Remember our equations is uh, CF divided by K minus G. So this is going to be CF for sure. Anything else? G? Anything else? YK? Inflation. Inflation, exactly. So that's going to affect everything. So it seems like a reasonable indicator, but it's not clear that if you just dump the lagged oil price in there, or the oil price change, okay, let's not just put the price in there, let's put the change in the oil price. I'm not clear it's going to work. As a matter of fact, I think it's not going to work. But we know there's a relation there. So can we do anything to that variable that might make it work? And, and be careful here. We don't want to dredge the data in doing something uh, to the oil price uh, change. An idea? Think about it this way. When does it work? And when does it not work? Yes? Do you have any recommendations? Do you have a strong belief about this particular variable? Not this one, but in general. Uh, this particular variable influence has been already caught up by others. Can you alter your uh, yes. Absolutely. If this variable is spanned by some other variable, uh, and the other variable is more powerful, then I will get rid of this variable. No, what I'm saying is that if you have a strong belief that others, other people, has already factored in this particular. If, if other people have factored this into the price, it's not going to be uh, a variable that's going to predict. We can test with this variable. It's a reasonable uh, variable to look at. Um, the, the place to grab this variable, the fastest place to get this variable is in um, Econometric. That's one of the databases that the library subscribes to. And it's one of the most popular series, West Texas Crude. Um, and you just grab it for your model. Okay. Yeah, Ray. Uh, I guess I'm not sure if you're going to add where it's a major factor in extreme cases. In extreme cases. So when the oil price is kind of like bumping along, very stable, doesn't really provide any information about future equity returns. Yet, when it starts to go up sharply, when the volatility increases, then potentially it influences the, the returns. Do you see that effect in uh, leading economic indicators like employment and, uh, and inflation? Yes. And yes. Do they have higher exponential or We need to test that. Okay, well let, let's figure the oil out first. Okay, then we can go with these other variables. Jay? Look at the slope of the oil price line. 
it's the it's slope of the up. line. Yeah, okay, so now you're talking about um, instead of just dumping in a lag return, and that a lag return or lag price change for oil, that is a real simple um, formulation. You know, if you were doing technical analysis on that, uh, you'd say, well, that that you know, we can do better than that. Just there's a lot of noise in the data. Uh, you know, kind of like random uh, supply shocks or or buying shocks. Is there a way that we can take that noisy oil price data and kind of smooth it out to extract some information about where it's going to go? Okay, because just the lag oil price isn't that useful. Remember, what we care about is not what the price is. We care about what the price will be. And what we want to do is to extract information from the price as it is today in the best possible way to forecast what's going to happen in the future. So you're exactly right that just putting the lag in there might not be what you want. And you're, you're talking a, a, some sort of short-term trend line that, that would just be some sort of moving average, let's say. Um, we could do um, a, you know, a short-term moving average relative to a longer-term moving average. And that's a classic technical indicator. So you take a short-term, divide it by the long-term moving average, and then it says something about it reverting to the longer-term moving average. So you could certainly do that. We could pick up the extreme cases and only load those in. So make some rule where when we cross a certain threshold, the variable comes on. Any other time, it takes the value of zero. So it's kind of like a strange, um, a strange variable. right? So it's part <coughs> of the time takes zero. Part of the time, it is, it is on, just like a regular variable. Okay? And the way to think about that is the full variables in the regression the change in the oil price, and then we're going to hit it with a dummy variable, a zero one one variable, that comes on when prices start to get volatile. And you need some predetermined rule. We just can't pick up the, um, and we can't experiment too much either. We have to have a rule that we set beforehand. If we start experimenting with different thresholds on the, on the oil price, like if it's above 12, $12, if it's above 13 14 keep on doing that, then one's going to work. Sit down, think <coughs> about it beforehand, establish what you think is a reasonable cutoff, and then construct your variable. And it doesn't mean that you can't try a few formulations. You can, but don't try 20 formulations. Okay? Another route to go is the get the slope in there somehow. How, is there another way you can get expectations of uh, longer term oil prices? Potentially, I've never seen anybody actually try that. It's maybe a little more complicated than just putting the, the futures curve in there because you've got the cost of carry and, and things like that you need to worry about. But there is a scenario where you could actually do that. Okay. So this is a, this is a reasonable variable. Yes. When you were uh, saying that we uh, have to define the threshold yes. without trying repeatedly. Can we uh, sort of look at the data and look at something that's reasonable? Is, is that so? That Absolutely. Really First yeah. thing you do, rule number one, is you graph the data. And you know, I said that before. Take a look at the data and then, you know, draw a line. You might want to draw more than one line. So you might have uh, a region where there's very low volatility. And again, you need to have a rule that is a rule that you can use going forward. Okay, so, and you might want a second region or a third region. And it just means that you would have, instead of just one oil price in there, you could have like a second oil price in, in your uh, regression. Okay, and it would just come on, you know, for example, you could have oil price come in if it's, if the lag price is, um, you know, between 10 and $20 a barrel, and then another variable if it's between 20 and, and up, and zero everywhere else. And get something out of that. Indeed, one of the exercises that might be very useful is what we did with the term structure. Where I said, well, what do the returns look like if I look at the month after the term <coughs> structure is inverted? And what do they look like the month after there's a positive uh, slope? And just look at the data. That's a simple cut. And what we're talking is much more complicated and much more dynamic in a regression uh, type of framework. So, so this is, I think, a good example of a variable that 
um, could be useful. It, it's not going to be my first choice of a variable, I'll tell you right now. Uh, I think there's other things that are more important, but it is a solid variable that has the ability potentially to predict some returns. Okay, what else? That's one. Yes? I think interest rates. Interest rates. And what do they affect? Well, they certainly affect K. Yes. Our required rate of return, but they also affect cash flows and growth, I believe. Because uh, in the high interest rate environment, the economic activity slows down, so cash flows essentially also uh, slow and grow. Right. Slows down. And, and indeed, you know, almost all these variables affect all three things, but in differing order of importance. So I think you've got the order right, K, C, F, and then to some degree, G. OK, why would an interest rate be useful for predicting an equity return? Well, they are <coughs> essentially, interest rates are a good indicator of the future economic activity. OK, so um, interest rates are forward-looking, right? They're, <coughs> to me, one of the most ideal indicators. And if it's a government bond, um, you know, it's like you know what the cash flows are going to be. There's no uncertainty there. You've got an expectation of what's going to happen in the future. And that's how the price is set today. Now, a tricky thing here, of course, is that's how the equity price is set, too. Right? The equity price also reflects expectations of the future. Of course it does. But the bond is a little different. The bond, you know what the cash flows are. You know what the timing is. With equity, you don't know what the cash flows are, and you don't know the timing. Indeed, there's also a terminal value issue, too. With the bond, you might exactly know what the terminal value. Five years, you get the $100. With the equity, it's got infinite life potential. So, so you've got like a yield to maturity, something like that, that, that is telling us something about the future, tells us something about expectations of what's going to happen in the economy, tells us something about expectations of inflation. This is a, a powerful indicator. Now, how might you put that into the regression? Just put the interest rate in? A short-term interest rate? Like with interest rate is very general uh, terminology. It can mean you know, thousands of things. Well, you can, I think you can either use the interest rate directly, or you can use a, a change in interest rate. OK. So those are. Those are two possibilities, and there are almost always going to be two possibilities like that. Okay, um, what interest rate? Or well, do you have something I, I would like actually it? lag it because oh. okay. in a way you are looking ahead about six months um, to actually see its effect. So I would probably lag it by about six months. Uh, let's say we're, you know, yesterday, <laughs> uh, January thirty-first. We're predicting February 2001. Um, are you saying that we want to use the, in our forecasting model for February 2001, you want to use an interest rate from September 2000? Yeah. OK. Actually, you can, you can take a look at that. But what you're going to find is almost always that the best information to use is the immediate lag, the most current information. And Yesterday was an important day, right? Rates dropped half a point in the US. So you want to have that information in there. I'm not saying that the information from the past is, is not that useful, um, because it could be. Because we could be building our trends and, and things like that from it. But if we're just interested in the actual interest rate itself, uh, or the change in the rate, probably best um, to, uh, to capture the immediate lag, OK? Now we'll take a break in just a minute, but there's one important thing I need to say here. Everything's got to be available yesterday. 
December 30, or January 31st. We need, you know, if we're going to use this model, because we're estimating this model, then we put the data for um, January 31st into the model and we forecast February. Better make sure that data is available January 31st. Interest rates are, equity returns, stuff like that, all of that is available. Jay? Why would you use just the interest rate and not the change? Because if you use the rate, 7% seems pretty low when you're talking about here in the 70s and 80s when rates were really high. And if you're trying to use historical data to predict. Right, so maybe it, it, this is very similar to your um, previous point about the, uh, the oil price. Maybe what you want to do is to look at this rate relative to the recent history. It doesn't have to be the change. Well, you could you put the change in there too, because we know, like yesterday, there's a change in the short-term interest rate. Okay, but maybe what you're interested in is what does that rate look like relative to the past year, right? And that's going to tell you something about the potential future path of the rate. Okay, so it's an excellent point that even though we, we identify the variables, how to put them into regression is a different story. Yes. Um, this is just because, but the, maybe the best way to, to use the interest rates in, in the model is uh, by comparing the expectations of the interest rates and the actual announce of the interest rates uh, target from the Fed. Right. Uh, so for example, <coughs> yesterday, every, every, mm, well, from what I read, there was an, a high expectations that, that the Fed was going to drop it for right. uh, 50 basis points. And that, that's what happened. And well, the markets look like uh, maybe not as much as, uh, for example, January 3rd. Right. No one was expecting that. So exactly. There's a, there a lot of reaction when when there is a difference of the expectations and the actual announcement. That that's exactly correct. And, and indeed, um, you know, one method for forecasting is to have a better model of the market expectation. Because if you're better, if you've got the best expectation, <coughs> then you're likely to make the most money on these, you know, announcements. Okay? Now, announcement like trading is, I'm going to try to separate that from this tactical asset allocation um, exercise. This is mainly event driven, and event driven forecasting is just very difficult to do. And maybe you can get some of them, but it's going to be very difficult to do. Kind of what I'm interested in is not necessarily what the Fed did yesterday, but kind of what is going to happen to the evolution of interest rates over the next month. Okay, so I'm not really, you know, I don't really care that much in my tactical models what, you know, the surprise was uh, yesterday or the surprise January 3rd. Um, I'm looking for information to extract about kind of longer term uh, predictability. John? When we're talking about short term tactical trading, is it um, not as reliable to use monthly indicators as opposed to these which are traded on a daily basis? Okay, it's another incredibly uh, good point. So when we say interest rate for January 2001, and assuming that we've identified an interest rate, let's say the Treasury bill or three month Treasury bill, so do we use the rate that's available the last day of the month? Do we use the rate that's the average over the month? Okay, so if you use just one day's rate, then potentially, you know, there's some volatility induced because it just bounces around during the month by you know, random chance. If you use the average over the month, then maybe you smooth some of that noise out. It could be more powerful. If you use the most recent, then you're capturing the most recent information, which is surely the most relevant. So you've got this trade-off of signal and noise, basically. And a lot of this is you know, model building that you have to actually experiment with. But sometimes I would use not the last day, but the last week. So figure out what happened in that week and put that into the model. And that did a lot better than looking at the whole month or the last day. OK, well, let's, um, let's take a break. And I want to pick up on interest rates because there's a lot more to do just on the rates.
Basically, substitute them in to your um, the software you develop for assignment number two. Remember, in assignment number two, I said, "Well, use some judgment to change the the forecast that that came out of um, the average returns." Well, you're going to have a quantitative model that will produce a prediction for the next month. And you're going to use that, and you're going to allocate. It's going to mean something different because. What you did in assignment two, if you used 31 years of data, was kind of the mean variance frontier, given that data, um, for the past 31 years. Now what you're going to do with these prediction models is to forecast ahead. And the mean variance frontier is going to give you the set of optimal, in quotation, uh, optimal weights for a portfolio that's one month ahead. You're holding from today to the end of the next month. This is where all this is going. So we're going to be building a quantitative sort of framework to do tactical asset allocation, albeit static, building that uh, for a one month ahead forecast. And that's where we're going. Now, um, I did want to do this, uh, this survey of the class to get the, um, the five year return. So before we jump to interest rates, um, I would like to go through and figure out where you stand. And then uh, what I'll do next uh, class is show you where you are compared to last year in terms of the frequency distribution <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and just to get an expectation. So uh, hopefully it's clear here. We're forecasting February 2001 through uh, January 2005. OK, so I want the average annual return of the S&P 500, your best guess of that. Uh, and I put a range of values in here. I'm just going to go through them. You raise your hand when, and, and this doesn't necessarily have to be anchored in your assignment number two, or we'd have a huge <laughs> amount of negatives, OK? Use your judgment here, OK? What do you think the best uh, forecast is of an average annual return, S&P 500? Do we have any takers for? Minus six, minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two. I had to put these in because that's what they look like from assignment number uh, <laughs> two. Oh, by the way, you'll get your assignment number two back. Uh, it'll be posted on the iDrive on Monday. I haven't gone through all of them yet. But uh, from what I've seen so far, other than the negative forecast, which I understand um, uh, where they came from, uh, it looks like very good work. Okay, minus one, zero. Okay, uh, one percent. It's a nominal return, right? One percent. Can you explain the game? What <laughs> okay, what zero is the average annual return for the S and P five hundred over the next five years? Between February two thousand one and two thousand. Right. So uh, basically, a zero would be you know, no return whatsoever. This is a total return, includes <coughs> dividends, as well as capital appreciation. Okay. Nobody for one. What about two? Three. OK. Three. Ah, hands hot. So I've got three, <laughs> four people at, at three. Uh, four percent? One. Two, five, one, two, three, four. Oh, hold on. One, two, three, four. 
four, five, six. Six percent? Seven percent? Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight? Nine? Ten? Five? Eleven? Uh, anybody higher than eleven? Okay, okay. Like twelve? Twelve? Twelve also? <laughs> Any, anybody? That's it, right? Anybody higher than twelve? No? Okay, uh, so that's, that's really interesting. Okay, well, we'll take that and compile the histogram, uh, figure out what the median is and the mean, and uh, you can see. Uh, actually, it's also the case that last year nobody was in this column. Oh, you've got the re re revision. Yeah, you didn't vote. Oh, that, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I will, uh, when I present the histogram, I will tell you where I stand, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's not gonna be the mean or the median. Okay. Uh, I, I do need to be careful as to what I say in terms of um, forecasts in this class because there is this history of um, litigation against professors making recommendations. If you ever wonder why we don't say, well, you know, you should short like crazy AT&T uh, right now, you know, and people <laughs> rushing out to the phone. Uh, yeah, we don't say stuff like that because there's pretty um, interesting case law uh, on that which is uh, much to our disadvantage. Okay, um, so we'll see where that goes. Hopefully it'll look like the um, spread of the, uh, the basketball score <coughs> on too. Um, okay, so let's, let's talk about interest rates. Um, it's a pretty general discussion right now. Let's make it a little more specific as to what we're gonna do exactly. Sitting down in your group, you have to put a list of variables together. Remember the way to do this, sit down and figure out a list, a finite list of variables. Okay, and that's what you're gonna use. Okay, then you're gonna get the data, you're gonna investigate whether these variables work. There could be some manipulation of the actual variable, so you might, you might wanna experiment a little bit with a moving average structure or something like that, but um, the basic list Know, you should preset. So saying interest rates is just not, not good enough. John? Um, if we talk about interest rates, can we not look at, uh, say, difference between um, AAA corporate bond and, and a lower grade investment uh, bond? And it's actually, it's mainly like uh, keep up rates. Sure, okay, so um, there are so many different interest rates out there that we need you know, to be specific. Right. We talked maybe a bit about the, uh, the three-month uh, treasury bill. Um, well, there's longer-term <coughs> bonds, and we've also got all the, the corporate bonds, and uh, we've got spreads. <coughs> okay, so we gotta have to think about how to put all of these variables in. Okay, so let me, let me begin to make a list as to how to get them in. So we could have a single interest rate like uh, TB3, three month treasury bill. Okay, remember, we're gonna be predicting, uh, what we care about predicting is um, the return RT. All of our variables are gonna be T minus one. Remember? So predicting February 2001 with January 2001 data. So we could put the actual level of the rate in. We could put <coughs> the change in the rate. Okay, and, and with the uh, delta representing the change. We could put um, the rate relative to the uh, moving average. So these are all candidate variables. 
and you choose the length of the moving average. So it could be one year, two years, or so there could be some experimentation here. So it gives the rate relative to the average. We potentially could even have a ratio of moving averages. So a fourth formulation, and I'll uh, make this uh, short form MA. So we could have, let's say, an MA3 for TB T minus 1 divided by an MA12 TB3 T minus 1. And that just says a three month moving average divided by a 12 month moving average. That's a possible, and that's a classic technical indicator. You know, a lot of people um, in kind of my role uh, spend a lot of time, um, what's the right word, um, talking unfavorably about charting and technical analysis and stuff like that. So well, my view is potentially there's some information there. Let's test it out. And this is the way to do it. The way to test it is not to look at some chart and say, well, head and shoulders is here, uh, therefore uh, you should be out of the market. It's not scientific to me. I want some hard rules, and I want to <coughs> validate through time. And basically, the simplest way to do that is throw it into a regression. Okay, so any of the ways you can think of uh, putting this stuff in? We could potentially manipulate the moving average <coughs> to make it uh, exponentially weighted. Okay, to give the most recent observations more weight. That's a possibility. Somebody mentioned earlier um, that we could look at surprise in the interest rate. I'm not going to put that up, but that's a possibility. I don't think it's, you're not going to get much out of that because it's so hard to calculate the surprises. Okay, so this is just the level of the rate. It's just like one dimension here. Now what we have to do is to consider um, <coughs> Consider different rates so we've got TB3 as a, as a possibility well we've also got um, and maybe let's rename this TB3M for three month treasury bill well we've also got treasury bonds out there of various different maturities so five year for example ten year We've also got um, the corporate sector out there. And the bonds that I like to use are the um, Moody's AAA, the BAA. Lehman has got a huge number of uh, bond indices that are useful also. Um, at the short end, uh, something like uh, commercial paper. And um, um, Euro bonds. So there's many different interest rates that are available to us. Now we have to be careful here because we just can't put into our regression a lagged five-year bond yield and a lagged 10-year bond yield. What's the reason? The extreme collinearity. Those things move together. So uh, put one in or put the spread in. So there's a bunch of spreads that we can consider using. We already talked about uh, one of them, and that's uh, TB five year minus TB three month. And I showed you results on that one. Um, in the assignment uh, number two, I'll give you historical data, and I think it was, um, it was AAA minus TB three M, is that correct? Okay, so that's got some credit risk in it. There is uh, different uh, maturity, so you might even want to look at the very short end of the yield curve. So TB1Y um, minus TB3M. So the very short end, you can look at the intermediate yield curve. T 
TB five year minus TB uh, one year. And you can look at the default spread directly by uh, looking at the following. Um, you could look at triple A minus TB 10 year, which is uh, prox and, and actually there are indices out there that approximately the duration of the 10 year. So you could be duration matching. And you could also uh, go B double A minus triple A. And this is the, the classic uh, default spread. So those are all spreads that are candidate variables. Does right. It, does it complicate things too much if you look at a spread like the TIVO rate minus the LIBOR rate? Like Good idea. Let's add it. So this is a kind of a, a default spread uh, right. here. So we've also got the possibility of going, um, yeah, LIBOR minus TB3 in the very short end. Since you're like, you know, if you're making predictions on the S&P 500 and you're bringing in the national rate. No, that's, uh, that's fine. People, that's, a, LIBOR is kind of standard uh, short-term interest rate in the world, right? So, and a lot of people look at the, uh, they used to look at, at least when the T-bill futures was uh, very active, the TED spread. So the Treasury Euro dollar spread at the very short end, um, the three month end, mainly off the futures. I've found that that variable's got very uh, interesting information for kind of what's gonna go on in the future. Okay. So these are all spreads, right? But then, you know, how are you gonna use these spreads? You just gonna dump them into your regression? <coughs> Well, yeah, I guess you could do that. Yeah, you look at my research, certainly what I've done. But it's the same thing as what we just talked about. There's many different ways that you can put a variable into a regression. So it might be that you've taken a look at the US yield curve. And you've noticed that there might be a trend in the spreads in the yield curve. So what you want to look at is the spread relative to what the, the spread has been or the level um, over the past uh, five years. So you can create these variables like this. Okay, so it just doesn't have to be the lag value. There's other possibilities in, in modeling. And it might be you want to put the lagged in there plus something else. So it is possible to put the lag spread into your regression and the lag change in the spread. Those are not, they're going to be related, but they're not going to be chronically uh, collinear. So, so you can do more than one variable with the same type of indicator, and you hope that it picks up uh, different information. Yes? Is there anything that you could, probably, you could do along the, just the yield curve shape? That is your the shape. Well, when we do the, the spread, we get like a slope that's based upon two points. <coughs> yeah. Um, so what you could do, what I've suggested here, is to look at different pieces of the curve. So you could look, um, you could look the one year to three month, and then you could look the five year to one year. You could look the ten year to five year, the thirty year to the ten year, and put the different pieces in there. The problem with that is that they're going to be pretty collinear. Okay, so, so there are some, some things that we can do about that. Any ideas? Let's say that we wanted to put in, um, let's make it simple. Uh, let's, instead of thinking about spreads, let's put in multiple interest rates, which with different maturities, which is kind of piecing out the, the term structure itself. So let's say we want to put the, um, the five-year bond in there, and we also wanted to put the 10-year bond, thinking that there's some unique information in the 10-year in the that's not captured in the five-year. How would we do that? Because I know if we just put them in, the correlation between the yields probably around, I'm guessing, 95%, which is too high. So how could we get both of these variables into our regression? 
And the answer really has to deal with just the way I phrased the question. So we think that there's some information in the 10 year that is not captured in the five year. So let me show you how to do this. Um, some unique information in the 10 year that's not captured in the five year. So what I would do is to run a pre-regression. This is not a prediction regression, it's an explanatory regression. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to regress TB 10 year at T equals A plus B TB 5 year at T plus some residual <coughs> epsilon. Okay. And what we get out of this is the following. This piece here is the part of the 10 year that is accounted for by what's happening in the five year. So how much of the variation in the 10 year yield can we purely explain with the five year bond yield? And that's what that beta times uh, the five year yield represents. What is the part that is unique to the 10 year that's unrelated to what's happening in the five year? Residual. So you would yank out this residual, and we could call this residual, uh, we could rename the variable res uh, TB 10, 10 year at T, right? And we would use that in a regression model and lag it. The, the terminology for this is the following. We have orthogonalized the 10-year bond with respect to the five-year. And orthogonalization just means that it's constructed in a way to have zero correlation. Okay, so that residual has zero correlation with the five-year. If you don't believe me, take that residual, yank it off and, and whatever you know, Excel or whatever stack graphics you use that still here? Yes or no? Okay, actually check the correlation. Take the residual correlated against the five year, it'll be exactly zero. That's just how regression works. Okay, so you captured the piece of the information that's unrelated to the uh, five year. You have no, you have, actually you have no multicollinearity problem, right? Because it's a zero correlation between these two variables. That's called orthogonalization. So there's a way, potentially, to capture um, the different piece of uh, the yield curve or different interest rates <coughs> doing an exercise like that. Okay. It turns out, and I should mention this, that in terms of forecasting, um, the actual forecasts that you're going to get are not going to be any different than if you just put the variables in as they were. But to interpret the variables is very important. <laughs> and if you've got these highly collinear variables in your regression, it's extremely difficult to interpret what's going on. Whereas if you orthogonalize, like I'm suggesting, you're going to be able to interpret. So we've got all these possibilities. So put the variable in uh, at the lag, put the change in the variable in. We could put some con construct of uh, a moving average. We've got different spreads to look at. And then what we talked about in the first half, maybe we want to construct this variable to come in during certain conditions. Okay, so and we would do that with, um, with a dummy variable. So we multiply our variable, which might be, um, we could call maybe one of our variables say ys5 uh, t minus 1 and that's going to equal tb5 year at t minus 1 minus tb3m at t minus 1. 
So that's a variable that we looked at in the very first lecture. Okay, so what we can do, we can put it in the regression as it is, or we could interact <coughs> it with another variable. So it comes in only at certain times. That's a possibility. So you could think of this coming in only when the yield curve is negatively sloped. Maybe you believe the only information in the yield curve is when the yield curve is negatively sloped. You can construct another variable by multiplying it by this uh, uh, dummy variable that will allow for that. Okay. Yes? Part of what I was thinking when I was getting at before as well is a certain part of the yield curve difference is the short term part is negative or maybe one in three or six months or something like this. That's where I was thinking that the shape of that is different from the overall. So that negative or positive is fine. So you've got an idea that there's some information in different pieces of the yield curve. And it might be that information is only relevant at certain times. So again, you can construct your variables like I'm suggesting. You can have them come on when a certain condition is met. You know, for the yield curve could be humped also. And that's unusual, but it's happened in the past. Well, what about looking at what happens when it's humped? We can do that. You know, again, the simplest exercise is what I suggested in the very first lecture. Just look at the data when it's humped. What happens the month after? Okay, so then that's really changing the variable. Instead of having um, you know, some sort of level or spread, it's just changing it into a, a, a zero, one indicator. Okay, does everybody see that? So there's another possibility here that we could take the variable, which might be ys. So remember, we could put ys in to our regression level. We could put the change. We could put a moving average. We could put a relative moving average. Okay. We could interact uh, with um, indicator or dummy. And we can also what I'll call coarsen. Okay, and that just means we're going to collapse the information in this variable. So if ys5 t minus 1 is less than 0, okay, then we'll call it new equals 1. Else new equals 0. We just created a dummy variable based upon the slope of the curve. It takes into account nothing about the, the relative level. So it doesn't matter if the slope is minus 0.1 or minus 10%. It's just going to assign a 1 for all the negatives. And it's going to assign a 0 for everything else. So this is just a way, this is, we're just model <coughs> building at this point. Now you can see already that the temptation to dredge the data is going to be very significant. I've already shown you, uh, you know, maybe a dozen ways to transform one variable. And that's not including the interactions. And then with interest rates, we've got 30 different variables that are, that are candidate uh, Interest rates, spreads included. So, so there's going to be a temptation to try all the combinations. And I want you to resist that. that it's actually for your, your own benefit to resist. You know, I know what happens. I know that you're not going to listen to me also. Um, and somebody's <laughs> going to be sitting there in the computer lab at 3 in the morning trying the 299th combination. Now, my experience suggests that 
might find something that's just not going to work out of sample. It's not worth it. It's much better to take your time and sit down and think about what a reasonable formulation is. You can graph the data, that's fine, but hold off on the regression until you've got some ideas as to what to do. And I think this idea of interacting variables is a, a very powerful idea. So we've talked about a simple interaction. If the yield curve is negative, then a sign of one, if it's <coughs> positive, a sign of zero. Well, these types of interactions can be used across different variables. So I've got my variable, this new variable, that picks up negative yield curve slopes. Is it the case that the lagged oil price change <coughs> really works well predicting stock returns when the yield curve has a negative slope? We've got a way to do that. We take the lag change in the oil price, multiply it by new, and I've got a variable that exactly falls into my model where the oil price comes in only when the yield curve has a negative slope. So we're talking about, when I'm talking about interaction, we need to be talking across different variables also. And a lot of this interaction gets around some of the fundamental problems in prediction. Remember I said, I think it was the first lecture, that some of these variables will be unstable through time. So unemployment going up is sometimes good news, sometimes bad news. So it looks like if you fit one coefficient, one coefficient, then it looks insignificant, right? Um, but if you fit during the time where it's good news, it's positive, bad news, it's negative. Well, is there a way to do this? Well, maybe if we multiply the unemployment rate by this yield curve variable, it's going to solve the problem. That we allow for different coefficients in different states. And indeed, we could have two variables. We could have a variable um, new that picks up all the times where the yield curve is negative. And let me actually write down um, this model. And it multiplies the unemployment rate. And then we can have um, another variable, um, nu minus, let's say, that picks up all the times where the yield curve is positive. And we put unemployment in the second time. So let me write that model down. So we know that this variable nu Um, T minus 1 is simply if um, the, the yield spread is negative and nu minus equals 1 if yield spread is positive. Okay, just construct the two dummy variables. You add those two variables together, what do you get? At every point in time, if you add those two variables together, one. Because when one is, takes on the value zero, the other takes on the value one. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is to run a regression. So returns at time t equals a, um, a0 plus a1. And let's say we're using unemployment. Let's call it u. Uh, t minus 1. And I'm going to multiply that by nu. And I've got a second variable, u t minus 1 times nu minus. And I've got a, a residual. Okay, so what I've done is I've broken the unemployment rate into two pieces. It means I'm going to have a coefficient when the yield curve is negative, and I've got a coefficient when the yield curve is positive. It's all t minus 1, so it's known in advance. It is possible. I'm not saying this is going to work. And unemployment we have to talk about also as a candidate variable. I'm not saying it's going to work. But there is a possibility if you simply put a variable in that you think's got some good intuition that comes in with a zero coefficient. 
Well, that's because in certain times it's got a positive coefficient, certain times it's got a negative coefficient. You force a common coefficient on the variable and you get nothing. T ratio is close to zero. And this is a way to break it up in kind of an economically meaningful way. You put the same variable in, there's no collinearity issue here, right? What happens when you add together u t minus 1 times nu and u t minus 1 times nu minus? What do you get? What's the new series? Just get the unemployment rate. Okay, so all we're doing, you think of this as uh, an Excel uh, spreadsheet. You've got a column that's got um, the unemployment rate through time. And let's say column B. Column C, you've got the unemployment rate only when yield curve is negative and zero everywhere else. And the next column, you've got the unemployment rate only when the yield curve is positively sloped and zero everywhere else. All we've done is just kind of deconstructed that variable and made it a function of something else that we know. And we have done, you know, what might seem trivial to you is very powerful step. A lot of these models in, in terms of quantitative asset management, they're just simple regression models. You fit the data. You put the seventh lag of the oil price in, and it comes in. And that's an extreme example. But it's fit over the whole sample. Or maybe they fit it over a shorter sample and kind of like roll it through time to get the coefficients to move a bit. They're constantly updating over a five-year window. What we're doing is saying, well, there's some economic reason why these coefficients are going to be different through time. And I'm going to allow this to happen. So I'm going to introduce you know, dynamic coefficients in a very simple way, not an ad hoc way. An ad hoc way is estimate every five years, or just keep on rolling it, and let the coefficients kind of evolve slowly. They will change, and they will change slowly. This way is much more powerful, it's much more nonlinear. And in a way, we're not really adding that much extra dimensionality. So even though the unemployment rate comes in twice to this regression, if you add those things together, you just get one variable, the unemployment rate. So, so this is something that uh, you know, is important. OK, so I think that we covered uh, interest rates uh, pretty well, um, I think. Anything else on interest rates that could be relevant? Yes. Can you just talk a little bit more about the integration behind it? Like you, you talked a lot about the different things you can do to the variables and how you can use within the model in and of right. itself. But like you started out saying that really the key to choosing these variables, the power of the model is your intuition of taking the variables. So like why would you do a spread? Why would you look at the default range? <coughs> Good point. And it's exactly what you need to be talking about um, for your assignment number three. And you have to justify to me. <laughs> Okay, why are you using these variables? And nobody's going to be able to justify the seventh lag of the oil price, right? But interest rates, uh, you know, we talked, uh, I guess, right at the, the beginning of the discussion of interest rates, that, you know, they're powerful because they are forward looking. So they capture expectations of real activity, they capture expectations of inflation, they capture the interaction between inflation and real activity. The corporate interest rates, they reflect default risk on, on top of that. And we know that default risk is very pro-cyclical uh, and leads the business cycle also. So when spreads start to increase, that's usually ominous for what's going to happen in the economy in the future. Right? Because we know in a recessionary time that there's a lot more default. So default probabilities increase, therefore those spreads uh, increase as a result. So this is just another metric uh, to grab that um, information today and hope that it's got some information about the future of the business cycle and the future of the equity returns as a result. Okay, so that's you know, some of the intuition. The, the fundamental uh, stuff that's going on here, um, if I say that an interest rate's got an expectation of inflation in it, it's, it's almost like that's what an interest rate is, right? The definition of a rate 
is an expected real component and an expected inflation component. Okay, now the question is how you divide the two expectations up, and it's going to be difficult. So it's not purely inflation, but it takes into account future expected inflation, and maybe that's going to be useful in forecasting equity returns, because we know there's a negative relation between uh, inflation and equity returns. And, and indeed, that's one of the main reasons there's a negative relationship between interest rates and equity returns also. So that's the, kind of the discussion that I'm looking for. Nobody wrote any of that down, but I guess you just replay the webcast. Um, you know, stuff like that is kind of the, the foundational stuff. Okay? Yeah, Brian. Just, just to make sure I understand the criticism about that, that set of lag price. It's not necessarily there's anything intrinsic about variable that's lag or it's the set of three. It's the pro it seems that there if that reflected the process by which they came up with the variable and just kind of threw that and all set up there and just kind of see what, what, what shelled out. That that doesn't reflect a very thorough like understanding of what is the relationship between the variables and whatnot. Is that the criticism? That is the I, criticism. Because I can see how a seven lag Yeah, the, the primary reason the seventh lag was in there was because lags one through six didn't work. That, that's not what they said, but that's what I deduced, okay? Because the economic story they told was so weak. You know, especially with oil, like you know what the story is, right? We see oil prices, you know, intraday. And to have to wait seven months for this to be reflected in the stock prices doesn't make any sense. Now, surely it could be reflected in seven months in terms of um, the cost to a business because there's inventories and stuff like that. But the stock market is seeing the stuff intraday. And it just doesn't make any economic sense to me that it's going to take that long to filter in to the equity returns. And even if it does, then there should be information in lag one through, um, through seven, not just the seven. The seven just out of the air from nowhere. It could have been the 13th flag. Everybody got that? Because that's an important point. <coughs> OK. Um, now, I put the unemployment rate in there. Who thinks that's a, a good indicator of uh, future returns? John? Just for a reason? <laughs> um, well, if more people are losing their jobs and they have less money to spend, so that's going to affect the company's cash flow. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a slowdown in the economy. So it's an indicator of the, uh, of the state of the economy. But how much of an indicator is it of the future? Well, I mean, if there's, uh, I mean, if there's a trend in the unemployment rate going up or um, you know, reaching certain 12-month highs or something like that, then it's a trend of probably where it's going to head in the future. And, how that affects <coughs> consumer confidence and spending. So this is an excellent uh, point here. Think about just dumping in the lagged unemployment rate into our regression. And we get a coefficient on it. Who knows what it is? Uh, let's say the coefficient is 0 0.3. That means, and let's say we fit our regression from 1970 to, uh, to the end of uh, 2000. That forces the same coefficient on that unemployment rate that might be, you know, it might be, let's say the unemployment rate is 4% in one year and then 4% like 20 years ago. And basically all you do is multiply the 4% times the 0.3 to get the impact on the stock returns. It's treated identically no matter where you are. So the 4%, you know, if you're coming off like a move from 2 to 4, that's going to be a lot different if you're coming off a move from 8 to 4 earlier in the sample. So it doesn't capture any dynamics. It's a simple regression. Just dump it in, get a coefficient, and maybe it comes in with a T ratio of 2. Let's go with it. I think we need to be smarter in the way that we do our modeling. So I think your point about looking at a relative to other things um, is important. Okay, remember, when you put a single regression in the model, that coefficient is telling you 
kind of the response of the future stock returns to the value of the variable. And when we do our out of sample forecast, um, we've got the most recent value of the variable, multiply it by the response. The response is best thought of, the response is the coefficient, is best thought of as the average response over the last 31 years. And is that what you really want? Want the average response? Or do you want the response that um, is estimated, you know, a little more carefully? It might be that you want the average. I'm not convinced. Again, we could say, well, this is the response if the yield curve has a negative slope. This is the response if the yield curve's got a positive slope. Or this is the response if the change in the unemployment rate over the last two years is negative. So it's actually gone down. This is the response if the change over the last two years has been positive. The unemployment rate has gone up. And you can think of how simply to construct a variable to do that, just like I did with the yield curve variable. So then it comes in twice. It's got a different response depending upon the fundamental economic conditions. OK, question. Yeah, Andy first. Yeah, leaning, uh, actually unemployment rate I think is a coincident <coughs> indicator or a lagging indicator. Now that's of the business cycle itself, right? and that's an ad hoc classification by the Department of Commerce. Okay, <coughs> so the stuff that's included in the leading indicators and the stuff in the coincident and the lagging indicators, all of them might predict stock returns. Okay, so don't be fooled by their classification. Well, I, I'm just saying that, I mean, you throw anything in there, it might be predicting. I mean, you see someone's password. Right. The, the, the real question is, is this variable, variable going to work? And I actually think no. Some of you are going to test it out. And I haven't tested it um, in terms of uh, some of these interaction variables. So that could be interesting to look at. But let me put another question here. Can I use this variable for my out-of-sample forecast for February um, 2001 that I go ahead January 31st? Is it a viable variable? Remember, January 31st, I've got my regression model. I feed in the lagged unemployment rate, which is January's unemployment rate, to get a forecast of February. Yes? You're not necessarily going to have the, the employment rate? You will not have that data. The last day of the month, you do not have the unemployment data. And you do not have almost every single uh, macroeconomic indicator. Inflation, for example, might be a candidate variable to, to use, too. That data is not available. Therefore, we cannot um, use the lagged unemployment rate in a prediction model. How do we fix this? Roll back another month. So go T minus 2. Because we do have the December rate available at the end of, uh, uh, at the end of January. And for some variables that have more than a month lag, you might have to go to a second lag. So go T minus 3. Yes? Well, it's, 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 it's the most recent data that we have available. <coughs> it's up to, to you to estimate, right? You have to go to the data and actually see if this, uh, this works. My, I'll give you my opinion. And my opinion is that there is a limited amount of value you can extract in terms of predictability from the standard macroeconomic type of data. Okay, GDP growth, which is quarterly. Uh, inflation. If I want inflation, you know, I can't put it in, right? It, it's not available at the end of uh, a January for January. So what do I do? How can I get inflation into my model? Jim? Can you use a proxy for inflation, like the price of gold or something like that? Or an interest rate. Supposedly got expected inflation right in it. Yeah, so commodities, 
are a good example of this, or, or interest rates. There's lots of stuff that we can do. What about using uh, predictions or expectations, forecasts of other economists sure. in your models? Sure. So expectational variables. Good idea. So indeed, you might want to put the expectation relative to the current value of that variable. So we've got some idea of inflation. We've got expected inflation by various people. Um, put that into the variable uh, as a variable in the model. Run it. See if it works. You know what I think is going to happen when you do that? It's going to be a lot of work to do, but um, that the interest rates can knock that variable out. Short-term interest rate, because it collapses those market expectations. But yeah, it, there's many different variables like this. So macroeconomic data is great, but two caveats. <coughs> First, you got to lag it at least twice. I don't want to see any models in assignment number three with the first lag of macroeconomic data. It's just, it's useless. We can't use it. And the second thing is beware because some of these variables could be better captured by a financial variable. Like inflation, I think is a good example. There could be some patterns in inflation that you want to pick out in terms of where we are relative to the past by using the raw inflation data, but the actual level of inflation that's expected. You know, remember, the release of inflation, we're going to use that yesterday when we ran our model, January 31st, using uh, December inflation. And that was the ex post inflation that was realized in December. Now, what's going to be more relevant? The inflation that was realized in December or the expected inflation <coughs> into the future that's captured in an interest rate. I think it's, it's the future that, that counts more. Now, there is a scenario for inflation, and people actually do this, that, well, we know what the components of inflation are. And for a big enough firm, it's not too hard to kind of check out the price of gas, price of bread, and the other stuff. So you could actually construct what do you think a good guess of the inflation rate is going to be in January, at the end of January, just by doing a survey of the components of inflation. But again, you know, do you want that, or do you want something that's looking forward into the future, like what's captured in inter interest rate? So I tend to be biased towards um, a lot of these financial variables that pick this stuff out. Well, um, with two minutes left, we can't go through the, the full list of uh, other variables. Um, I want you to think about the other variables. We've kind of covered um, a few of them, uh, a few fundamental variables. But there's some stuff that is really important that we haven't captured. And that are um, kind of fundamental variables that are related to the firm. And you've got data on you know, price earnings ratios for different indices, price to book ratios, dividend yield we talked about last time as being a classic variable where uh, you just can't put it in the regression for the whole time period. Okay. Variables like that, um, there's also things we'll talk about um, on Monday, volatility. And I think I might start Monday with kind of a list, uh, a further list of uh, variables for prediction. Okay, and introduce how to do um, a <coughs> volatility prediction. But there's other stuff, like volatility itself could be very useful. People talk a lot about the, um, the VIX. People know what the VIX is, the, volat the implied volatility in the S&P 100 uh, index option. Okay, so it's a market volatility. Well, look at that a lot, you know, for, for uh, credit research and, and stuff like that. It's a measure of the volatility, the uncertainty in the market as a whole. Potentially, the volatility comes into our prediction also. That could be important. So it's all sorts of things um, that are potentially important. The fundamental variables, volatility kind of variables, lots of interest rates, macroeconomic data. All of this comes in potentially, and we're going to extract out of this a modest R squared, maybe. 
So to set your expectations, I already said this, but we should be talking 5%. Now, the one important uh, issue here is, you know, what, what is the impact of this? And let me just show you one graph, the final thing that I'll do. Um, and this is basically what happens to the investment opportunities when you introduce one variable. And this is on the, um, I put this on the iDrive with a bunch of um, uh, files on predictability. This is the standard mean variance frontier. It just looks at a three month treasury bill and the S&P, and actually it's the world uh, return. The MSCI world. US Treasury bill, MSCI world. And then basically I say, well, let's allow for some dynamic trading based upon the slope of the term structure. Okay? Remember, all of these portfolios are fixed weight. Okay, you buy and hold for the whole time. Well, it's not even buy and hold. You rebalance to get the fixed weight. This is a traditional frontier. When you introduce just one variable that we know has got some predictability, you jump to this frontier here. It greatly expands the opportunities that are available. Indeed, sort of rule of thumb amongst practitioners doing predictability and tactical asset allocation, that the cutoff level of R squared is point, okay, get this, point zero zero seven. So a little less than 1% that you take a look at. You don't need that much predictability to put a trading strategy together to do tactical asset allocation that will lead to um, significant improvements in sharp ratios. So even though we're talking about a modest amount of predictability, it is really magnified when we start to do our asset allocation. Because we're using predictability in many different uh, asset classes together to get a better strategy, dynamic ways. So even 1% R-squared is going to make a difference. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's leave it there, and we will uh, go to volatility on Monday. <laughs>